This is Reset. I'm Sasha Ann Simons. Growing up in the 1980s and 90s, Sarah McCammon's Midwestern family was steeped in the evangelical church. She was taught to obey God, not to question her faith, and that her eternal salvation was secured in heaven. For the most part, McCammon followed the rules. The young girl, who would later become a journalist, was a true believer and tried to help save the people around her who didn't follow Jesus. But after covering the Trump campaign for NPR in 2016, McCammon saw the power of evangelical Christian beliefs on the political right. She's since joined a growing movement of ex-evangelicals, people rethinking an entire worldview and identity and walking away from the conservative religious community. Now she's written about the journey in her debut novel, The Ex-Evangelicals, Loving, Living, and Leaving the White Evangelical Church. And Sarah McCammon joins us now in the studio. Welcome to Reset, Sarah. Hi, Sasha. Thanks for having me. You are so used to telling other people's stories. I know that very well <laughs> as a reporter myself. But this time around, Sarah, there was no way that you could stand on the sidelines, right? You had to get personal with this book. So talk about how you feel now that it's out. And we're also learning so much about your life's journey. Yeah, well, I spent a lot of time thinking about what I wanted to say. And um, I want to be clear, you know, I had had my own kind of break from from the evangelical church quite a number of years before I covered the Trump campaign. But while I was covering it, this community that I had come from was such a pivotal part of the conversation about where the Republican Party was going, where the country was going. And I spent some time talking with evangelicals who were uncomfortable with the alignment of their movement with Trump. Now, I you know, wouldn't have called myself an evangelical anymore at that point, but I knew that world really well. And people began, people who knew that about me began to ask sort of, well, what do you see? How do you make sense of the evangelical support for Trump? And I, you know, decided I wanted to answer that by writing a book. Um, and one of the things I did come across in the course of that reporting was ex-evangelicals, people who, mm -hmm. like me, for various reasons, had made some kind of a break with their childhood faith. Many of them felt like the movement was overly politicized and was veering into extremism. And the Trump moment didn't necessarily cause this rupture, but it sort of spotlighted it and I think catalyzed conversations around it. Um, and, and you're right. So I couldn't, you know, I couldn't totally, I, I tried in my reporting to separate myself as much as possible. Yeah. But I knew that I knew a lot about this world and gave it a lot of thought, decided I had things I wanted to say. And yeah. and I think now I feel pretty, pretty good about what I said. I mean, I spent a lot of time thinking about how to design this book, how to, how to, interweave my experiences with with the with these conversations with lots of other people who've walked similar paths. Yeah. No, you, you should feel good. I mean, this is very thoughtfully written and, and, and it's clear once you pick up the text. Here's the thing, you know, we are taught that religion is just one of those topics that we shouldn't typically broach with people, right? Unless you've got some level of comfort there right. already. Were there parts of this story that were difficult for you to share publicly? You know, it's funny that there's that old cliche, right? Don't talk about religion and politics. Yes. But we, how can we not right now? I mean, <laughs> it's so true. You know, it is religious um, ideas are infused into our politics in ways we sometimes discuss openly and sometimes don't, but, but they're right there under the surface. And I grew up in a household where we did talk about those things all the time. So mm -hmm. I'm quite used to talking about them. Um, you know, in many ways, I think I became a journalist because I wanted to get away from that a little bit, from at least from t talking about them in a way that felt like I was coming into the conversation with predetermined answers. Yeah. Because, you know, journalism is about asking questions more than than having answers. Um, but, of course, there were things that were hard to write about. I mean, I, I write about um, I write about my family. In order to write about my childhood, I had to talk about my family, and I tried to be very thoughtful about what I said. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I talked about some of the difficult dynamics in our family. Um, a central character in the book is my grandfather, who was one of the very few people I knew growing up who was not a, an evangelical Christian, not a Christian at all. Right. You know, I talk about growing up in this world that was, as many evangelical kids do to one extent or another, that was totally surrounded by um, evangelical Christian media, my s Christian school with its own Christian textbooks, right. some of which taught things that were frankly inaccurate or missing important context in retrospect. Um and Christian TV, radio, it was a whole, uh, you know, what I, what I and others have described as a parallel universe yeah. in a way. Um, and, and my grandpa was the one person I knew well who wasn't part of that. And, yeah. and it was 
that created a lot of tension and pain in my childhood and and even to this day. And and so that was difficult to write about, but it was so important to the story. Like I couldn't tell my story. Anytime people ask me, you know, how did you go from where you were to where you are now? My grandpa is always part of that conversation. And yeah. so it had to be part of this book too. And we'll talk more about your grandpa because there there's so much there to 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 discover. But I want to go back to your childhood and and sort of have you define the evangelical church for me. At that time, what did it mean to you, to Sarah the child? What was your understanding back then of the core beliefs or the mission or what you were responsible for? So there were theological beliefs and then there were also political ideas that were becoming more and more infused with those theological beliefs. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, it's, I've been talking a lot the last few days. Um, so in terms of theology, you know, we believed that... Um, the Bible was literally true. It was inerrant, and that led us to believe things like that the, the earth was six to 10,000 years old. We had a you know creationist view of the origins of the world. I was taught that in my Christian school. Um, we also, you know, we, we focused, of course, as most Christians do, on Jesus, on salvation through Jesus. But there was a real sense um, that we had to share that. And, you know, the word evangelical <laughs> is comes from the same root as the word evangelize. Mm -hmm. And so we were told to, you know, pray for the salvation of my grandfather, witness, share the gospel with people that believe differently. Um, you know, I had a youth group activity once, or I think it was a, a retreat where we went out on the streets in Kansas City and handed out, you know, Christian tracts and asked people, if you die tonight, do you know what would happen to you? Um, which was kind of the, the opening line we were taught. Um, and, you know, we regarded anybody who didn't agree with us, and not just certainly people of other faiths or no faith, but even other types of Christians. We were skeptical of Catholics. We were skeptical of mainline Protestants um, as, as you know, not saved, likely not saved at least. Um, so it was kind of a narrow little box mm -hmm. in retrospect that, that we felt, um, you know, that I sort of grew up, that my, my world was sort of constrained by. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the political beliefs – the way that I was raised were really just infused with that. I mean, I, I write about James Dobson, who was a high profile evangelical leader. He started out primarily as a sort of therapist, marriage and family counselor, doing um, parenting advice on the radio and in books, and became hugely popular in the evangelical world, hugely influential. And from that, spun out into um, political activism for the Republican Party. And, and still to this day, even though he's in his upper 80s, is, is involved in, in Republican politics. And so in my world, there was really no separation between Christian and Republican. I mm. mean, I remember going to college, going to an evangelical college here in the Chicago area, and um, there was one family that was Democrats that I knew of. I'm sure there was more than one, but there are very few. And I just remember being like, wow, how, how does that work? Like, mm. how, how can you be a Christian and a Democrat, you know? Um, because those things were just synonymous for yeah. us. Your, your parents truly lived the, the, the scripture, train up a child the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And I remember you writing about when you were 10, Sarah, and you got your very own lavender leather Bible. That's right. King James Version. You were so proud. You wrote inside, Believer's Baptism, eight years old, yeah. saved, two and a half. Yeah. What did that mean? Um, <coughs> I'm sorry. No, you're fine. <clears throat> um, well, so in many Christian traditions, um, in fact, it's an older Christian tradition, uh, infants are baptized to be welcome into the faith. And in um, some forms of Protestantism, particularly evangelical Protestantism, uh, that that ritual has been um, replaced by um, adult baptism. And there's a whole history there, which I'll leave to church historians and religious scholars. But um, most evangelical churches today don't practice infant baptism. They practice adult baptism. And that means that you have to have sort of accepted accepted Christ, accepted this um, on your own before you can be baptized. So, you know, instead of baptism and confirmation and the kind of rituals that you'd see in many, many other churches, um, we believed you had to sort of pray a prayer of accepting Jesus. That's how you became a Christian. That was sort of the, the it was almost a replacement for a ritual, but it, it was kind of a ritual. Mm -hmm. um, but we believed it was more than a ritual. It, it really meant something spiritually. And then when you got older, you could make a choice to be baptized, which I did when I was eight years old. And I, you know, it was, um, you know, a big mega church, yeah. kind of one of the early mega churches. So there was a big tub in the back that oh, they yeah. would uncover, you know. And um, Yeah, I yeah. did my version in 2015. 
at a mega church in, in Rochester, New York. Yeah. And it was the same deal. It was overwhelming, but, you know, that was sort of the way to go as a Christian. Right. Yeah. That was, that was what we, we believed in. Yeah. For sure. Well, I want to go back to your grandpa now, right? Because um, you thought as a child, you, you, you grew up thinking grandpa's going to hell. Mm-hmm. Uh, you opened the book, sort of introducing us to him and his story. Now, he had come out as as gay and um, you know wasn't a believer like you and your siblings and your mom and dad. What was it like to watch your family shun him back then? And then now, looking back, how do you feel about that behavior? I just, what I remember more than anything was just like a horrible awkwardness and tension. Um, and I didn't fully understand it when I was younger, I just knew that we were, you know, we saw Grandpa. We would see him at Christmas. Sometimes he would come over, you know, every now and then if I was sick or something and bring me a gift. And, you know, um, and, you know, I knew that I knew that he was somebody that was really respected. You know, he was a Harvard-trained neurosurgeon. He was retired um, when I was pretty young but active in the arts community in Kansas City. And, you know, he wasn't the kind of person that you, you would be cautious about. But... We didn't. We hadn't. Didn't have a lot. Of, we didn't have a closeness with him, and I think I probably assumed that it was just because we didn't share the same beliefs, and we were really concerned about that. We worried about his soul, but we didn't. You know, unlike a lot of grandparents, I didn't spend the night over there. I didn't. You know, it wasn't wasn't a closeness. Mm-hmm. Um, it, we weren't estranged either. I want to be clear, but we weren't cl- we weren't close. And when I was, and I describe in the book when I was about twelve or so, how I discovered that sort of this secret about his sexuality had been hidden from me. And, you know, my parents told me that they were worried that if we were around, after they told me he was gay, um, that if we were around gay people, it would normalize it for us. That was the word that they used. And, um, you know, I that was what my church taught. That was what my, my Christian school taught, that homosexuality was a sin. And, um, and I think I just accepted that. But I also felt this kind of unease in, in the family. There was always this unease about being around him and knowing how my parents felt. And, and it was just a real source of, I guess it was a source of cognitive dissonance for me too, because I had to sort of confront the fact that there were people who lived and believed totally differently than we did. Yeah. And, um, but you know, as I got older, I did get to know him. I, I spent more time with him. Um, and, And I'm grateful that I had many, many years to do that. He lived a very long life. And, you know, in retrospect, I mean, this is something I'm very sad about. I'm sad that I didn't have more time, um, more of a normal childhood family relationship, I guess. I think it would have been really healthy for our family to have been closer. Um, But I think it just wasn't possible because of the ideological divide. And... When we talk broadly about evangelicals, I want to be clear of the demographic, Sarah. So can you break that down for us? I mean, we're not just referring to white Christians when we talk about evangelicals. Like, who makes up this group? Yeah, I mean, and this is, the term evangelical is one that, you know, scholars and pollsters argue about and struggle to define. And I mean, generally, it refers to uh, conservative Protestant theology, uh, you know, an emphasis on salvation through Jesus, an emphasis on uh, the the uh, authority of the Bible and on sharing one's faith, as I described, and, and often some kind of charge to activism, whether it's political activism or, or or working to help the poor or otherwise. I mean, that's historically what it's meant. But um, when we talk about evangelicals today, it's really important to talk about race because while many people um, – across the American church may share the same theological beliefs on paper, regardless of skin color, regardless of race. Um, Race is really determinative of how people vote in this country. And black Christians and white Christians um, who believe similar things vote very differently. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, um, you know, and, and certainly there are some parallels, right, from church to church. And the evangelical movement is so big and complex, and it's made up of sort of subsects and intersecting and cross-pollinating, you know, streams of Christian thought. And so it, it is hard to categorize. But um, when the reason I have the word white in the subtitle is because the politics of the white church are so different than the politics of the black church by and large. And then you can talk about, you know, other groups as well, Latino evangelicals. Um, which are, is a growing group. Is a growing group, and 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 you know that's that's a separate con- that's another conversation altogether. But um, 
you know, there's a chapter in the book that, called Leave Loud that focuses on a group of black Christians who were who had spent a lot of time in mostly white evangelical spaces, white seminaries, white churches, and really around the time of the, the rise of Donald Trump, and then a couple of years later with the police killing of George Floyd, um, came to feel that their churches, as much as they might pay lip service to wanting to be diverse and wanting to include people of color, um, they weren't prioritizing the concerns of their brothers and sisters of color. And yeah. so um, Dr. Jamar Tisby and others kind of led this this mostly online movement called Leave Loud, which was to say, if churches aren't prioritizing the issues of concern for us, we're going to leave and we're going to let them know why. So what have been the biggest drivers, Sarah, for ex-evangelicals to leave the church? And I wonder if there was a particular moment for you where you said, I don't know about this. Well, the book is sort of organized around different themes, and I don't, it's certainly not exhaustive. There are many reasons, as, there's as many reasons as there are people, and, you know, some people sort of have found these ex-evangelical social media spaces like Facebook groups and TikTok hashtags and Everyone's podcasts. path is different. Yeah, everyone's path is different, but there is sort of, a, you know, what I call an online movement, really, of, of people who are finding each other and talking about this experience that a lot of people call deconstruction. Um, and it, it's, it involves coming to terms with what they've been taught and what their church teaches and then trying to make sense of it, of sort of what they experience and see in the world. So one of the big drivers, I mean, certainly this, as I've mentioned, the last several years, the political divisiveness of the last several years, I think, have prompted a lot of soul searching for some people. They've also just prompted other people who had a discomfort with where the movement was going mm-hmm. to talk about it. Um, but uh so I think it, you know, extremist politics might be one reason. Um, certainly, the evangelical view of of LGBTQ people is a big theme. Um, you know, there's a lot of polling that suggests that younger evangelicals are much more accepting of same sex marriage than their the older generations. And I so think so. There's a divide within. There's a generational the invali- divide. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, so those are some of the big ones. But there are as many reasons as there are people. And and for many people, it's a lot of things that kind of come to a head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sex and sexuality, they're, they're particularly complicated topics mm-hmm. for, for post-evangelicals uh, because, you know, you were essentially immersed in purity culture and, and taught from a young age to deny natural body urges and no sex before marriage, things like that. Um, you write about this as it pertained to, well, the ultimate destruction of your first marriage, Right. You sent an email to your parents mm-hmm. to tell them you were getting divorced. Uh, talk us through that. You you said that their reaction that you got was sort of the worst. It was almost the worst case scenario. Yeah. You know, I didn't include their email in the book because um, I didn't, frankly, I had to, I had to talk about them to talk about the book, to, to talk about my childhood and, and to talk about my own sort of interaction with evangelicalism. But I, I didn't want to make it any worse than it needed to be. But I, so suffice it to say, um, you know, I had really hoped that they would understand and support me when I was going through that. And it, and I think they just, much like they weren't able to understand my grandfather's sexuality, they weren't able to understand the decisions I'd made and the struggle I had gone through. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's, and that's really painful. And it's a theme I hear a lot from, from people who've made a break with their religious community, a sense of rejection or judgment, you know, um, there's this rhetoric that we love you, we accept you. <laughs> But it doesn't always feel that way. Um, and, you know, the, the purity comes culture. with conditions. Yeah, it feels that way to a lot of people. Um, and, and, you know, purity culture sort of reached its peak in the 90s. There were these books like uh, I Kissed Dating Goodbye by, by Joshua Harris, which was a, a huge bestseller, which many, many millennial evangelicals read. It was often formative in their view of sexuality and marriage. And, you know, fast forward decades later and, you know, come to find out, for a lot of people, this sort of rigid view of sexuality that was very narrow um, and very strict, it led people people to rush into marriages or to avoid relationships out of fear of, mm-hmm. you know, quote unquote, sinning. And so, you know, I talked to a spectrum of people and there's there's been other good work on this, but by others, there's been entire books written about it. But um, but I wanted to at least touch on it because it is a big theme. And I think sexuality is, isn't easy, I don't think. I mean, relationships aren't easy. It's hard to figure out how to get it right. That's right. But what purity culture offered was this formula that kind of promised that if you follow this, it'll all work out. Right. And in the real world. Until it doesn't. It doesn't always. Right. Yeah. Until it doesn't work out. 
Uh, let's go back to Trump for just a moment, right? As I, I said at the beginning, you know, you covered Donald Trump's presidential campaign back in 2016. Uh, we all sort of know this story. We know Trump appealed to many evangelical Christians while also driving some away from their faith, I would say is fair to say. But uh, even now, as he's facing, you know, criminal charges for his involvement in the uh, January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol, we still see that some evangelicals strongly support Donald Trump. What do you make of this? Why? Why is he the guy when he's he's not of the religious community, but he's just been made to be this tool to get the message across? You know, this was like the big question that hung over the 2016 campaign and that kind of launched me on the reporting that led to this book. And, you know, I talk about in the book remembering the way that my evangelical community regarded uh, former President Bill Clinton's moral failings, you know, the Clinton Lewinsky scandal. Um, and, you know, many of the same evangelical leaders or, or people associated with them who spoke out loudly then about the importance of character. Um, fast forward 20 years later or so, uh, 2016, were aligned with with Trump. And, and, it, and you know, I, I really, one of the things that, that prompted me to write this book was um, I was doing a story in 2016 about evangelical women who were um, really just sort of mystified by the the release of the Access Hollywood video and the response mm -hmm. of the evangelical movement to that and to Trump. And and for some women, that was kind of a breaking point. And, you know, when that was when I actually first came across the term ex-evangelical, uh, a woman who said, you know, I don't even want to use this, this label anymore. Mm -hmm. But you're right. For many others, they were happy to overlook that. And I think if you look at... If you look at the messaging that Trump used, the idea of making America great again, in many ways, it echoes some of the ideas that evangelicals had been hearing from their leaders, from their pastors, this idea that, you know, America was once a Christian nation that was in decline, that had fallen away from God, whether it was because of the sexual revolution or the rise of secularism or whatever. Mm -hmm. And and so I think that that message resonated for some. And, you know, Trump he courted evangelical leaders. He promised to do the things they wanted to do, like overturn Roe v. Wade, and he got that done. And so I think in many ways, it's it's not that big of a surprise. He was, he might not have been, you know, the the, the line I've heard before is, we need a president, not a pastor. Um, or God uses flawed people. You know, we've heard all of this from evangelical leaders. Yeah. And I, I think that pretty much sums it up. It's this idea that Trump needed a base and the evangelical movement especially seeing sort of the decline of white Christian cultural power, mm -hmm. needed a champion. And they found, you know, sort of a partnership in that. Later in the book, you write, quote, for those of us wandering out of evangelicalism, we can find ourselves in a foreign and often frightening spiritual and emotional wilderness. What's been the scariest part of leaving your faith? You know, for me, there were just so many things over the years that didn't add up. The way that we thought about my grandfather, the way that we thought about my friends of other faiths, the way that, um, the way that you know, many of the people around me refused to accept scientific fact. Um, all of that made me feel like I had been misled. And I was also taught, though, to be authentic, to seek the truth, to try to do what's right. And so when you feel like, Trying to do what's right and seek the truth <laughs> uh, conflicts with some of the other things you've been taught. It's a very sort of confusing and overwhelming place to be. Yeah, and and so you know, for me, there, I, there there were just these moments where I felt like I can't endorse this project. I don't think this is who I am. Where does the strength come from to stand against that? Well, I, I mean, it's I think I don't know if it's strength so much as it's just being unable to pretend. You know. I didn't want to pretend to be something I wasn't or to believe something I wasn't, and especially to try to promote ideas that I didn't um, feel were good ones. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean, you know, and then it, and then then the question is, where do you go? And, you know, what do you do with, I mean, I'm, I'm still a person that has an interest in spirituality and certainly uh, wants to try to understand what's right and good, which I think is a lot of what religion tries to be about, at least. You know, how are we supposed to live? What are we supposed to believe in? What should we do while we're here? And I still care about those things. Um, and so when the answers you're given sort of 
in a nice little box don't don't seem to work, then what do you do? And I think my whole life has been kind of a process of trying to figure that out, mm -hmm. but also being more okay with not having everything figured out. Though you are a self-described ex-evangelical, you're still part of a religious community, right? You still believe in Jesus. You still pray. Where are you finding hope these days in, in the state of the church and just the state of this country? Well, I would say I, you know, I never described myself as an evangelical when I was, and I ex-evangelical is not a term I, you know, necessarily would use. I mean, I think it, I think it does describe me, but it's not, I it's not as if I've like taken on this mantle and this is who I am. You know, it's just when I heard that word, I thought, wow, this really describes something that I understand, which is having been part of a community and, and leaving it. And I think, you know, what I really want people to understand about evangelicalism is that in many ways it is, it's a subculture. It's a robust culture. Like there is, there are cartoons and books and movies and songs in just a language around being evangelical that's sort of distinct. And, you know, when you leave any community, there's a there's a loss and a grief and, and a need to kind of figure out where you go next. Um, and so, you know, these days I, you know, I, some, I go to church sometimes, on, especially on important holidays. Mm -hmm. That's important to me. Um, I'm also in an interfaith marriage. My husband is Jewish, so we go to synagogue quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But you haven't converted, right? No, I've not converted. Yeah. Um, but that's, and that's meaningful for me. It's something that we can share. I feel like I can pray in a synagogue or a church or anywhere. You, you said in the book that being with him may be a gift from God. It feels that way. Yeah. I mean, I feel, I feel like I've learned from seeing how someone raised in a different tradition experiences faith. You know, it's just a different sort of set of assumptions and expectations and, um, none of the sphere of damnation, which is refreshing. Um, but, you know, I didn't write this book to tell anybody. I mean, this is my journey, but like, I, I didn't write the book to tell anybody what there should be. I just, I was seeing something happen when I looked around, mm -hmm. when I looked in some of these social media spaces. I, and, and I just meet people all the time who say, oh yeah, I grew up evangelical and I'm, you know, struggling with this or that. <laughs> you know, it happens all the time in the real world. And I just felt like something was happening that I wanted to say something about, particularly because this community has been so influential in shaping our politics. So leave us with this. Who's this book for? And if, if nothing else, what do you want the folks who read it to walk away with? I mean, it's truly for everyone. I think I'm hearing from a lot of people who grew up evangelical who are saying, wow, this is my story. This is, I feel so seen. And that's exactly what I hoped would happen. I'm also hearing from people who you know, come from other faiths or don't really understand the evangelical world and are like, wow, this really explains so much about the culture. I just, I've always struggled to figure out what the evangelical culture is all about and how, uh, what the thinking is like. And, and this explains a lot. Um, so it's really for everyone. And I hope that people who are still in evangelical churches will read it because I don't think it's, it's not anti-faith at all. It's, um, it's really about my journey and the journeys of quite a number of other people I've talked to. And I hope it will provide sort of some empathy all around and just some insight into, into what that's like. You know, there are, at one of my signings this week, a, a couple came up to me and said that they were sort of deconstructing or, or, or rethinking some things. Um, and their adult children were as well. And it was harder for their adult children. And they were kind of picking my brain about what, you know, what they should do. And I don't like to give advice, but I, I was really just happy to hear that question being asked, you know. Um, especially if there is sort of a generational gap or divide. I hope it will foster conversation and like true conversation, you know, not debate, not argument, but let me hear you. Let me understand why faith is so hard for you or why this kind of faith is so hard for you. And um, yeah. I think I think some of the responses I've appreciated the most are from people in my life who are still religious, maybe even evangelical, but are just curious and open and compassionate. You're certainly a great storyteller, so it, it makes for a wonderful book. That's Sarah McCammon, journalist and author of The Exvangelicals, Loving, Living, and Leaving the White Evangelical Church. The book is out now, and you can find it wherever books are sold. Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you.